Now, things got heated in Westminster today. Yeah, I know. Shock horror, right? This time, it was between Alex Salmond and Douglas Ross, appearing before the Scottish Affairs Committee. The pair clashed over the Calmac ferry fiasco. Ross attempted to pin the blame of the delayed vessels on the former First Minister. Let's see Mr Salmond take a pop at the Scottish Tory leader. And, of course, you uh, agreed the contracts to build two ferries that still aren't servicing the islands they were supposed to uh, work for. Is, well, is that the type of delivery you think should be celebrated? Well, just on the third one, I had no part or agreement on the contracts for the ferries, if you check the record there. You had no the... part at all? You didn't? No, no, I had, no, no, no they, they, weren't, they were agreed after. The contracts for the ferries were... Some time after I left office, uh, Douglas, check the record. No, no, the, the no, actual, no. well, just, just no, on no. that point then, if we're going to, to argue that point, no, no, I'm not you, arguing you were point. involved in the earlier stages no. to secure the contract going no, to that no, yard. No. Right, can, well, OK, let me give you a bit of time scale. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the saving of the Ferguson yard took place in August, September 2014. Just uh, the uh, referendum. Just before the referendum, yeah. I, I left office in November 2014. I promise you... The, the two ferry contracts, I mean, I don't know where they were in the EFOR, but they certainly weren't anywhere near the civil service. So they, they were, they were uh, negotiated some time after I left office. Now, you were involved in the nationalisation of that yard? Uh, no. Uh, I, 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 I was involved in saving the yard, and a private business took over the yard. The nationalisation of the yard was four years later. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's many people like me who are looking back over the last 20 years that get my dates mixed up, Douglas. You're, you're meant to be on the spot and on the ball. Two parliaments, that'd be quite exhausting going back and forth. Well, fortunately, you don't have that problem anymore since you're not sitting in either. But I just <laughs> wonder about that point. You were involved in the early stages, but if you don't want to... Recover. If, if, if you don't want sorry, to... No, well, let, 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 let me be quite oh, exact. Oh, order, I, order, I, order. I, well, uh, I'm delighted to say that we are now joined by Alex Salmond, fresh from that particular uh, very unbruising um, match, I would say, with Douglas Ross. I mean, uh, is it just the paucity of talent in um, the Tory party in Scotland or have they just got very bad advisers? Welcome. Well, great to be here, Mike. No, I think the parliamentary term for, the, for that exchange, the, the technical parliamentary term, is upper gum tree. <laughs> uh, so I mean, I, I don't know what, what he's. I mean, I don't know what he's taking for his breakfast. Yeah. But clearly, it's not doing him any good. No. And the thing is, we've all been in that situation. I dare say, at one point or another, where you realise that you might be working with the wrong information. And from your answers earlier on, it seemed very clear that he was working with the wrong information. But unlike most people, he didn't give up. He just kept going. I mean, it was like a gift, wasn't it? It was like, <laughs> how about me? Just keep coming. Yeah, it was, he's only got one gear, that boy, and that's backwards. Just. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a very, very shocking situation. But, I mean, a busy day for you as well, because you were here basically effectively to answer questions about the relationships variously uh, presumably in the past between Westminster and Holyrood, how it all worked, and notwithstanding his rather uh, childish jibe about you not being in two parliaments anymore. I mean, you were in two parliaments at one point, weren't you? Uh, and won, I think, nine elections. <laughs> <laughs> he loved to he loved to work to get to that total. Yeah. But no, I, I was, I, of course, I was outraged because, I mean, I left a dinner in Berlin last night. Yes. With Ban Ki-moon, mm. Sharon Stone, yeah. Bob Geldof, yes. with, with the Pope appearing, giving us... Uh, uh, a benedictory message. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, and I left that to come to the Scottish Affairs Select Committee. Yes. And with that enormous sacrifice, you know, leaving the, the dinner at midnight, turning into a pumpkin so as I could yes. catch the first plane to London, I get treated like that. I know, I absolutely know. shocking. I mean, if I it's mean, any I, consolation, if it's any consolation, you definitely won the internet battle <laughs> because there was there was many people saying. Isn't it nice to see somebody who actually knows what he's doing, knows what he's talking about, and is actually a proper, you know, leader of politics in in uh, in the chair that you were sitting in? And I'm not just yeah. saying this to you. You know, because people sometimes after you've been on my show, they go, "Why are you always giving him such an easy time, that Alex Salmon?" Well, it's not that I give you an easy time. It's just that I recognise what you've done. Yeah, well, I get messages saying, "Why do you treat that fascist Mike Graham with such <laughs> kid gloves?" And it's outrageous. <laughs> I tell you, one thing I do despair of. Uh, uh, and that I can't understand why people get away mm. with reading their questions. Yes. Now, look, not everybody, you know, is blessed with a great memory. And, you know, some people have disabilities, and you know that. There's a lot of things account. to remember. That's right. fine. Uh, absolutely. But you know, back back in the day, uh, if you tried to read a question, uh, you know, there was general derision around yes. the Westminster Chamber, and it's the same in the Scots Parliament. Yeah. You know, read questions. You know, they read the question, the minister reads the answer. Mm. 
and then they read their follow-up. Yes. I mean, <laughs> so, and you just think to yourself, okay, don't, not everybody can speak off the cuff. That's right. well understandable. It's yeah. not the, the talent everybody has. But to ask a question or maybe two or three sentences yeah. on a subject that you've chosen that presumably you want to ask a question on, I mean, I, I'm, you know, most things in Westminster, I wouldn't go back to the bad old days, but I think I would go back mm. to treating people who read also, questions with a bit of, uh, not, not derision, but certainly say, come on, up your game. Yes, exactly. And I don't think it's unreasonable to expect politicians and people who are elected representatives mm. of the people to be able to stand on their own two feet Tribunals. and actually occasionally speak off the cuff. I don't think that should be in any way considered special. If that's what you want to do for a living, then bloody well learn how to do it. It certainly would make it better viewing. It just, certainly would. Because, see, if you're reading everything, you'd be as well just reading Hansard the next day. And yes. Let, let's dispense with the parliamentary proceedings. Yeah. Let's just everybody read everything into the record. Right. And, you know, and forget and about fact, having sessions. As, 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 as Andrew Eborn, our AI mm. specialist, would say, just get some AI bot to read it and you don't even have to turn up because you've already prepared your answer. Uh, I can exclusively reveal that uh, you, your interviewing style does not rely on artificial intelligence. No, it certainly doesn't. No, no intelligence whatsoever, in fact. <laughs> you know. uh, I've been briefed by some very stupid people. Um, let me ask you about some of the other things that went on, though, because you were asked quite a few interesting mm. questions. We've got another a clip here, I think, when you were talked about uh, and you were asked about what a new government should actually look to do. Like there's going to be a new government coming. With your experience in your seven years as First Minister, I mean, what would your advice be to them about resolving, fixing, trying to come to terms with getting a government relations? What would you propose and suggest that they maybe think about as a priority? Well, I, for, well, I would say, well, I don't rely on old chums. You know, don't rely on the informal network. I mean, the, the great wisdom which uh, that. Uh, your enemies sometimes sit alongside you, as opposed to opposite you, uh, should employ uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, the, the idea that you can compensate for effective processes of government with you hoping that somebody gets on with somebody else, I think is ludicrous. So for goodness sake, don't fall back into that trap. So is that a myth then, that you can bring in your kind of um, suitors, if you like, like, like in the way that Boris Johnson sort of did, and in the way that Rishi Sunak has done, they've surrounded themselves with people that they know might want the job, but they hope that by keeping them close, they won't mess it up. Well, the first time I ever heard the phrase a, a, a cabinet of chumps yeah. it was John Major's administration, which uh, after the 92 election, mm. which promptly fell apart <laughs> for all sorts of right. reasons within virtually no time at all, so, so the chums didn't end up so chummy. Well, largely, hilariously, for the Back to Basics campaign, which was all about which, which, good moral which, standing. Which was pursued by John Major. There were sort of babies being born, abortions being ordered, yeah. you know, affairs being had. Incredible. I think, I mean, what, what John Major always said was he didn't mean it to be like that. It was meant to be, Back to Basics was meant to be to having appropriate toilet sp stops for <laughs> motorways. <laughs> but, but unfortunately, it didn't come across necessarily right. as that. But look, the, the, the issue there was that the, the, some Labour ministers you know, gave evidence saying well, they, they didn't really need to have the joint ministerial committees mm. between Scotland, Wales and London and, and Northern Ireland because they all knew each other. Right. You know, they'd all been colleagues together at Westminster, so there was no real issues. But right. listen, when, I, when I came to office in 2007, there was a bundle of outstanding issues, mm. fierce arguments, yeah. usually about money. Right. Uh, they were totally unresolved and had been unresolved for years. They were still arguing about whether the Olympic infrastructure funding uh, should be barnetage. There should be an allocation right. for Scotland and Wales you know, through the Barnet formula. Right. And you know, that was 2007, so that was at least mm. you know eight years right. before, you know, after the millennium and, and the run-up to the... And they're out to the Olympics, and that we didn't resolve that until about 2010 yeah. 11. No, right. And I guess for Keir Starmer, there's no need to worry about his old chums because he doesn't really have any. He's dumped them all, hasn't he? I mean, people like Jeremy Corbyn won't be being offered a seat in the cabinet if he gets in, and many of his other sort of fellow cohorts from the days when he was a supporter of Corbyn won't want to be anywhere near it either. Uh, I did see a clip the other day which had Keir Starmer saying how he was loyally supporting his. Uh, 
his leader, yes. uh, as it turned out, with a rope. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, he also said he was his friend at one, one time, and he now says they were never friends. So I think it's a bit difficult uh, to, to believe a word that Keir Starmer I, I says. Did, I mean, I, I, I prefer, uh, and I made no bones about it, I, I don't know Sir Keir Starmer that well, incidentally, but, you know, from what I see of him, I, I rather preferred uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. I, I mean, I, I knew him for 30 years. I didn't agree with him in lots and lots of issues. Right. But I, I thought, and still think, that he, he's a decent guy. And... Uh, he, uh, he pursued his aims consistently. Now, that's not always a, a great advantage, mm. uh, but uh, I, I rather... I find many of his qualities admirable, whatever mm. disagreements I had with him. Yes. Politically. Well, that's fair enough, I mean, and, and, and as it should be. Mm. Um, tell us about this dinner, though, because, um, you know, if the Pope was, was, was hanging around. Bob Geldof... Well, he, he, Bob, Bob was, Geldof goes everywhere the Pope goes, doesn't he? <laughs> well, the Pope was down the line. Yeah. Uh, but it was, uh, it was, a, it, was a, 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 it was an international peace conference, which was, which I was speaking at, which is, which uh, had aspects of cinema attached mm. to it. So I mean, it attracted everybody. You know, right. Attracted, you know, politicians like me looking for a good gig to speak. People like Bob Geldof yeah. looking for a good gig. Incidentally, I, I did say to, to Bob, as I now shall call yeah. him. I said to him, you know, I think you should try his hand at Irish politics. He said, under no circumstances. I said, look. I mean, he, he speaks very well. Yeah, he does. Uh, and he's he's hard, he doesn't speak very well without swearing, though. He, he's quite hard to stop him swearing. Yeah, well, he didn't, to be fair, he didn't... I mean, maybe it was the presence of the Pope. Maybe. I don't know, but, yeah, yeah. but he, didn't, he didn't swear that much at, at the conference, I remember, but he spoke eloquently. Yeah. And so, I mean, the, the Irish currently have, uh, and Michael Higgins, have, mm. have a neutral and a president who's a poet. Yes. Uh, and a very, very estimable man, in my opinion. So maybe Bob Geldof could run to be an ex-Uteron. He could. If um, you've got, you got a poet, get a singer. And what was this peace conference's pronouncement on um, our Prince William's latest um, endeavours? It, it, it didn't feature uh, the... Uh, uh, strangely enough, uh, and uh, I know that you won't be happy with him, and it's quite an interesting thing. See, I actually agree with uh, the sentiment, I think, the, the Prince was trying to mm. express. Whether it's wise for them to do so uh, is well, another matter. Well, that's my issue. That's my issue. Uh, and uh, you know, he's going to have to... I mean, there is a fine you know, line which the royalty obviously shouldn't cross. Mm. The, her late majesty, the Queen, the real Queen, as I call her, yeah. uh, you know, she managed, by and large, certainly in the latter part of her reign, mm. to, uh, reign to stay on the, the right side of that line. Yeah. Uh, I'm not... I mean, you know, uh, Prince William's certainly got his toe in the line, let's put it that way. Yeah. He absolutely has. Alex, we're out of time, unfortunately, but we will see you again. I think you're going to be appearing on Plank of the Week this week uh, as a panellist, I should stress, I hope. Well, well, I told the select committee, actually, when they said, you know, great to have you here, and they're flying in from Berlin. I said, look, no, I was, I was doing Plank of the Week. So <laughs> I, 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 fit, I fitted you in. Very good. Into the schedule. <laughs> well said. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. Great, Cheers, great pleasure to see you as ever. Alex Salmon there, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We'll hear from him more uh, on Friday night on Plank of the Week.